Okay, so can you just explain a little bit about your background in Cherry Hill, where you grew up, where you attended school? Sure. Um, my family moved here from Detroit in Michigan in March of 1977. Uh, we moved to Kingston, so I grew up on Sheffield Road, and I started attending school at Kingston Elementary uh, in March of 77 in kindergarten. Uh, and I traveled all the way through the, through the Cherry Hill Public Schools. Uh, I went to Kingston Kindergarten through sixth grade. I went to Brainerd Junior High, uh, which is now Carusi Middle School for seventh and eighth grade. In fact, Dr. Carusi uh, was the principal at the time. Then I went to High School West for ninth grade through twelfth grade. Graduated from High School West in June of uh, 1989. Um, and then left, went to college uh, up in Northeastern PA. Little school, it was called Allentown College of St. Francis de Sales. It's now De Sales University. Um, and when I graduated in 93, I came home um, and I taught. Uh, I got a job teaching in Willingboro. I taught eighth grade history in Willingboro for a year. Uh, and then left uh, Willingboro and went to Maple Shade and spent 10 years in Maple Shade working over there before I came back to Cherry Hill. I taught history and English in Maple Shade. I was director of curriculum for a year. Uh, I was principal of the Steinhauer School for three years. And then I was able to return to, to work in Cherry Hill. Um, and I've always lived in Cherry Hill you know, since we got here. My wife and I got married in, in July of 1995, so we've just been married 20 years. Uh, we bought a house uh, in Kingston. I live right off of Chapel Avenue. Um, so we've lived there for 20 years. Uh, and I had the opportunity when I came back to the district, I was principal at Kingston for a year. I was principal at Carusi for two years, and I was principal at High School West for seven years. Uh, so I was actually principal of all of the schools that I attended, uh, which was neat. You know, I mean, there were there were still some teachers at each of the schools that I had had um, as a teacher when I was a student, which was an interesting dynamic uh, to go through. I had the opportunity. My my oldest daughter was in first grade when I worked at Kingston, and then she was a freshman and sophomore uh, when I was still at West. So that was a neat, unique experience. Then there was a group of kids that, that I was actually their principal in fifth grade, sixth grade, and seventh grade, then ninth through twelfth grade. So for seven years of their school experience, I was their principal. Uh, so I really had to see the opportunity to watch kids grow, uh, see them go through the different developmental stages, you know, see how they changed, see how they stayed the same, uh, but really got a chance to, uh, to watch them. Um, so now I just started in September 1st as in my uh, 13th year uh, back in Cherry Hill. And it's actually my my 23rd year in, uh, in education. Now, what's so special about Cherry Hill? What has kept you here? Um, and um, how do you think your connection to Cherry Hill will affect um, your job as a superintendent here? So keeping me here, when I, when I was in, in school, I really liked school. Um, I, was, I was one of those people that, that just enjoyed school. I enjoyed being around other people. I enjoyed the interaction. Um, I, you know, I, I liked discussion. I loved to talk. Uh, I really liked to read, so I, I always really liked school. When I was a student at West, uh, I was involved in student government. Wrote an article for the uh, for uh, for the Lions were you know dining with Joe, with Joe, so I used to get to go out and do different restaurant reviews and things like that. I was involved um, in the theater and, and all kinds of different things, so I really liked it. My goal, and I knew when I was in high school that I wanted to be a teacher. Uh, at that time, I really thought that I always wanted to come back and teach at West, um, and that just never worked out. And honestly, I'm I'm thankful for that. Um, because I think I was able to grow more as an educator and as a person, you know, leaving the district rather than coming back at, at 22 years old or 23 years old and trying to go back to the same school and teach. Uh, I think it gave me a chance to grow up, you know, and, and to really to, to um, create an identi identity for myself as an adult. Um, what keeps me here, um, you know, is my wife and I are raising our kids here. You know, this, is, this has been home for me. Um, there's a comfortability that I have uh, and a connectedness that I have to people in town. Um, there's a lot of folks uh, that, that I grew up with and went through school with uh, who graduated from both East and, and West back in the late 80s and early 90s who are also living here and raising their children. Um, so there's a commitment that I feel and a responsibility that I feel um, to do what's best for all of the kids that are here. Uh, and for me it's meaningful. You know, the, the, I spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of hours at work. And I like that. I, I enjoy being a part of it. You know, when I was the principal at West, I tried to attend as many events as I could and I was there all the time. But I was still only a mile and a half from home, you know, so I still had the opportunity to, to go home and see the, see my wife, see the girls, um, and then be back at things. You know, so there's a there's there's a responsibility and relationship that I think exists now um, that's different. It's not just a job. Um, you know, I, I feel deeply responsible for everything that goes on here, for the education of all the kids that are here, uh, and I truly desire that everybody has a successful experience and a positive experience. It doesn't always work out that way. You know, there are times that are challenging, but it's also my responsibility to help people work through that. Um, so that's why I stay. 
you know, it, 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 it's meaningful to me. Um, what are some of the challenges that are facing the Cherry Hill School District right now? So public education in and of itself in 2015, you know, has a lot of challenges. And I would say that the first one and the biggest one is money. Um, you know, money is a challenge in all that we do. You guys, I'm sure, experience that, you know, even in, in, in your lives right now. You know, we always want more money because there's more things that we want to do. We have to make choices about how we spend our money. Um, and there's only a set amount of money that we can have every year. Um, you know, we are very fortunate um, that, that we are in a township like Cherry Hill uh, where people support education. Um, and, and by supporting education, you know, they're, they're involved and, and they know what's going on and they try and come up with ways um, that, that we can make every dollar that we have stretch. Uh, but truly, I think the biggest issue that we're facing is, is money. Uh, and well, that will continue to be an issue um, because property taxes can only go so high. Uh, people are only, only able and willing to pay so much in, in tax to support what goes on. Um, so the money discussion, I think, will always be a part of what we do in public education. Um, I think one of the other big, biggest challenges that we face um, are the outside influences uh, about how we measure success and what truly is a measurement of success. You know, whether that's through standardized tests, um, you know, like the SAT or PSAT or the HESPA or the PARC, uh, and what our relationship is with assessments like that. You know, and what do we do? What do people on the outside think of us? And we, we get some incredible external validators. You know, Saturday Magazine just put, you know, put out rankings of schools in lots of different areas. Newsweek Magazine, you know, just identified High School East as number 85 school, high school out of the top 500 in the country, um, which is phenomenal. When you look, and if you look at the top 100 list from Newsweek, um, I'd say New Jersey is probably represented more than almost any other state. Seven of the top 11 high schools in Newsweek are from New Jersey. Um, but there are all kinds of outside influences, you know, and how do we internalize those? How do we adapt our programs? Uh, and truly, how do we maintain focus on the needs of the students who are here on a daily basis? You know, the Jeffersonian ideal of public education is something I truly believe in. You know, and I believe that there's a, there's a level of local control where we meet the needs of the children and the families who are here um, to best prepare them uh, as they get ready to graduate. So I would say those are the two really big issues that face us. Um, you know, it's, uh, again, I think that we're very fortunate, you know, where we all live right now because we have an incredibly supportive community. And it's a good place um, to live, and it's a great place to, to go to school. Um, what are some of your priorities for this upcoming school year? It's a great question. Um, so I actually have a, a transition plan that will be coming out. We'll post it on, on Friday afternoon. It'll list some of the things that I'd like to do. Um, but I would say during the course of the first year, um, the biggest goal that I really have, and even during the course of the first six months, is getting out there and speaking to people um, that are involved or are affected by the school system. So there's an easy intact group to be able to go out, and that'll be to go to schools and meet with students uh, and be able to meet with staff because they're here. Um, I meet with the PTA, I meet with the board, I'll meet with the mayor and town council, um, and then I'll expand beyond that. You know, today I was in, in Camden for a meeting uh, earlier today with the um, Senator Booker's staff. Um, we talk about you know, the relationship that Cherry Hill has with the senator and you know, what's going on at the federal level and what involvement and what voice do we have. I'll meet with other local and, and state level legislators uh, about what goes on. Well, then expanded in the community. You know, people who have lived in the township and no longer have kids in school are still impacted by what we do. I want to know what do they think is working well? What are their concerns? What are their questions? What relationship do they currently have with the district? So the biggest piece for me over the course of the first six months really is to get out there and, and to talk to people. Um, and then the other side, you know, in, in terms of, of what goes on within the district, one of my big goals, one of the things I will work with all the administrators and with the staff on is how do we individualize instruction to meet the needs of every child? Um, we are blessed because we have incredibly talented teachers who work in this district, people who are very dedicated to students being successful. I think we can always improve on what we do. And sometimes that means pushing, sometimes that means pulling and prodding, uh, but it definitely means initiating the conversation and discussing with folks about what do you do in the classroom. Not all children learn the same way. Not all children will get things on the same day when something is taught. So how do we help them? And how do we get kids who are successful? How do we push them? How do we move them even farther ahead? Again, an incredibly successful school district, two very successful high schools. I want us to be better. I want us to be in a continuous improvement model, uh, and I want us to continue to grow. Um, you know, and, and again, being able to do that here, as we talk about why do I stay, makes it incredibly meaningful. I like what goes on. I'm excited about the discussion. I'm even excited at times when people don't always agree. I think that's healthy. If we all had the same ideas, and we all everybody just nodded their head and said yes, it wouldn't be a lot of fun, nor would it be developmentally appropriate or beneficial for everyone. 
So I want to get out there. I, you know, I, I want to turn over the rocks. I want to open up the doors uh, and ask the questions about how can we improve on what we are doing. Um, so you mentioned the fantastic teachers that we have here in the Cherry Hill District, mm -hmm. but um, the perception in this community is that teachers are not always treated properly. Mm -hmm. um, how will the contract situation, how will you address that this year? So the contract situation is, is definitely a challenging one. You know, we live in a state where you know we are we are governed by collective bargaining agreements. Um, you know, the the Board of Education, um, you know, who represents the district and and CHEA, the Cherry Hill Education Association, who represents um, the certificated staff, the professional staff that are in the district, are currently trying to negotiate and coming to agreement. Um, if I can can find an appropriate role to help move that process along and to assist that process, I am all for that uh, and willing to do it. You know, it, it's my goal that 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 they that they're able to reach an agreement. I have not been directly involved in the process until last week because I just came into the into the job on September first, uh, and the process at this point is you know um, 16 or 17 months old. Um, so my goal is to try to help both sides come to an agreement that is beneficial to everyone. Um, and we do have incredibly talented staff members who are here. You know, it's the human resources and the people that make up the district truly are what make this district so valuable. And that's the people that work in the district, and that's the families that support the district, and ultimately that's the children who are here. The 11,000, almost 500 kids who are here on a daily basis are what make this district alive, you know, and, and, and give us, truly as educators, the greatest jobs in the world. Because I do believe that educators have the greatest jobs. There are challenges that go along with them. Uh, you know, but I, I do believe that the association and the board will work out a fair and equitable agreement you know, that'll benefit everyone. Um, so the infrastructure of many schools in Cherry Hill is failing. Um, well, how will you address this issue? So we need to look at, there's a long-range plan within the district. There, there is emergency work that's been done over the last couple of years, and, and you ladies have experienced mm -hmm. that, and, and your, your, your folks at High School East, for sure, down in the gym locker rooms have experienced that. And there are other issues that exist throughout the district. So as part of our long-range plan, we will look at what's scheduled to be worked on during the next five years and during the next ten years. Um, the Board of Education, you know, part of what they do with the Strategic Planning Committee is to look at what needs to be done. You know, so we look at that on a number of different levels. The first is financial. What money do we have to spend? Um, our district and, and with the work of the board, um, you know, has done an incredible amount of work over the course of the last six or seven years. Uh, we've had support from the state with additional funding that's come through to do that. Um, like the replacement of the boilers. We've replaced boilers throughout the district over the last couple of years, uh, which is an incredible amount of work. They've done lighting, they've done um, you know, uh, uh, electrical work and, and things like that. Um, so we will look at each of the individual buildings, what needs to be done, what has to be done in order to support the infrastructure for the buildings to remain viable, and to remain open, what would be beneficial to be done, and we'll start to categorize you know, what those pieces are. Um, they have projects that are slated that need to be done over the course of the next three years already. Uh, and we will look to branch that out and build on that into the future. You know, and that may mean looking for additional ways to do it. Um, again, a lot of it comes down to funding uh, and what has to take place. Um, so last year, Park called a, caused a great deal of confusion in many of the school districts. How will we change how we address Park this year? <laughs> so as we look at Park, uh, Park has changed. The administration of the actual assessment you know, is being adapted for the second year. Um, you know, whereas last year there were two sittings for the park, this year there'll be one sitting. Um, you know, we will start to do formal discussions in in public way. Um, you know, at meetings, at subcommittees of the board, uh, and at the board level, probably starting early in November. Um, I will tell you honestly, right now, we're waiting for additional information from the Department of Ed uh, about one, what are the results going to look like from the from the, the students who took the assessments last year, and then what's going to change structurally for this year. Because right now, we're just kind of waiting on information. Um, you know, as soon as we have stuff, my goal uh, in terms of communication is to get things out and make things as transparent and as public as possible. You know, that doesn't do us any good for us to receive information, not to share that with the community. Um, the idea of assessment, and I will tell you as, a, as an educator, we, as, we do assessments all the time. That, that's what we do. That's how we know that, that people are successful, that kids are learning, the kids are acquiring knowledge and acquiring skills and the ability to analyze and to process. We assess, and that's done in informal ways and formal ways. I believe that assessment is appropriate. The questions we will continue to ask are, what type of assessment is appropriate? Is the structure of the park, is that appropriate? And if it is, then what do we do to meet the needs of the children who are taking the park? 
is it, if it's not appropriate, then where is our voice and how do we have our voice heard? And that's where it comes in relationships and building relationships with, with legislators uh, and with different people throughout the community to say, what else can we do to try and adapt what, what takes place? Um, so right now, the biggest piece really is that we're looking to see uh, what information will we get from the state and what structurally will change for this year. Like you mentioned earlier, East placed 85th mm -hmm. in Newsweek's top 500 schools. However, West didn't even place within the top 500. Mm -hmm. um, do you think a discrepancy between the two high schools is, exists? And if so, what will you do to address that discrepancy? Sure. So there, there's a couple of pieces. So they, they Newsweek ranked the top 500 schools. Um, and I will tell you with their process, if you look at their, their actual methodology mm -hmm. in terms of how do they do that, they didn't necessarily re request information from every school mm -hmm. either. Um, you know, so it's, it's intriguing uh, in terms of from whom do they request information and what do they do with the information that they receive. Um, is there a discrepancy? There's a difference between the two schools. Um, there's a difference between many of the schools, you know, that are, that are in town. And you can look at, you know, what are the differences um, and, and what exists. The same curriculum exists in each of the classes across the district. In ninth grade at High School East and in ninth grade at High School West, the English curriculum is the same. The expectation is that children at the end of the academic year finish at the same spot or have been exposed to the same type of information and have acquired the same skills. Ninth grade through 12th grade, kindergarten through eighth grade, that doesn't change. Whether you're any of the 12 elementaries or any of the three middle schools, the curriculum, there's one set curriculum that exists for the difference, or for the district. Is there a difference? There's a difference in the level of performance in terms of outcome. Um, but I would also contend that there's, that there's a difference in terms of socioeconomic status of the community that is being served by the two high schools. Um, you know, and, and that has an impact. Um, it, it has an impact on the breadth of um, the level of achievement, you know, and, and the, the breadth of, of, of what does that look like for, uh, for the individual schools. One of the great things about our township, one of the great things about the two high schools, is we do have two phenomenal high schools. You know, when, when you look at, at rankings to go through and look at the variety in terms of, or the variety of ways in, in terms of how they are ranked. There are, ch there are students that graduate from both high schools that are currently at Harvard and Princeton and Yale. And, Duke and Michigan State, University of Michigan, um, University of Virginia, that exists from East, that exists from West. Um, there tends to be a wider range uh, when you look at, at where things go. Um, you all, the, the, you folks at East Side did a great article, in fact the paper sent up there on the bookshelf, a great article in June, you know, about college choices, you know, and what are the college choices. And, and if you recall, I think there were pictures of kids in, in six different sweatshirts, you know, on the front page about, you know, where are most kids from East going. And what does that look like? Um, so, is there a discrepancy? There's a difference uh, between the two schools. Um, there, the, when you look at, at hard and fast numbers, is there a difference in the SAT average between the two schools? There is. Is there a difference in the number of, of national merit semifinals between the two schools? There is, uh, and that's okay. There are differences. I would, you know, the, part of my goal and part of my desire is that both of the schools continue to improve. You know, that both the schools embrace the communities that they serve. They meet the needs of the students where they are when they arrive, and they help to push them beyond where they thought they could achieve. Recently, a student from West uh, came by my house. Uh, he was fundraising. Mm -hmm. And in a conversation with him, he mentioned that he went to Rosa and was planning on going to East. However, due to some incident where he got in trouble, he ended up going to West instead. They sent him to West mm -hmm. rather than East. And I've heard from teachers and from other students that this happens um, more frequently than I would have expected, that students at East get sent to West. Is this true, and what statement can you make on that? So I will tell you, it's, it's not true to my knowledge. Um, children are not moved, or students are not moved in terms of the disciplinary piece. You know, to, they're, they're not forced transferred from one school to another. Um, that just doesn't take place, at least in my experience. Uh, and I'll tell you, that even goes back to the years that I spent you know, as principal at, at High School West. Um, transfers do occur, and transfers do exist. Kids leave East, and they go to West. Kids leave West, and they go to East. Um, requires a number of steps for that to take place. You know, because again, there, we have an open enrollment policy in the district, which means that students get the, the opportunity, families get the opportunity once to select the high school where the kids go. You know, so that's regardless of your, of your address, regardless of where you went to middle school, you get to choose East, or you get to choose West. Sometimes families, sometimes students realize this isn't the right fit, this is why, these are the issues. Um, there could always be extenuating circumstances, there could always be different things that feed into it. Each one is taken on an individual basis to go through. But I would say that the statement of, if, if he said, well, I wasn't allowed to go there because I got in trouble, that would be news to me. That's not, at least in the ones that I've dealt with through the years, 
that's not been a reason that's come through. Um, but you know, urban legend gets out there as well you know, in terms of what things are. Um, East and I'm assuming West both use the Marzano method. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this method is effective because their students sometimes do not fully believe in this method? So the Marzano method um, it deals with teacher evaluation. So the statute, the guidelines change for teacher evaluation. We are now going into the third year of using this model. Um, and a lot of it, you know, and there's a, so there's a relationship uh, on the periphery between the Marzano teacher evaluation, between the park assessment, because it was all part of changes in federal guidelines uh, about education. You know, what do we do? How do we measure ourselves? How do we measure success? Um, so there was a district-wide committee that met, I guess, four years ago uh, at this point and looked at all kinds of different evaluation models. And the district-wide committee was made up of uh, professional staff, certificated staff, teachers and, and counselors and folks like that, and administrators. Um, got together and, and viewed all kinds of different models and then selected uh, the, the Marzano model. So the Marzano model is, is named after a guy, Dr. Bob Marzano, who's a researcher, um, was not a teacher, did not work in a classroom, stuff like that. He truly is an educational researcher. Uh, and what Dr. Marzano did throughout his research uh, was take lots of other research to find out about what makes effective instruction. Um, looking at the Marzano model for teacher evaluation, uh, it truly is a clinical model. You know, so it's, it's a snapshot in time. It's an administrator or anybody truly coming in and looking at the interaction between the instructor and the students and the students and the, and the, and the knowledge or the information uh, and what goes on. How does it exist? What goes back and forth? How are the children learning? Are they learning? How do we know that they're learning? And then again, what is the instructor's role uh, in terms of what goes on? I think there's a tremendous value to the research that went into the evaluation tool. I think it's a very challenging evaluation tool to use. Uh, there are a number of different areas that are measured. There are a number of different um, things that are to be looked at in, in every evaluation. Almost that it becomes overwhelming in terms of where it is. Um, I don't believe that as an educator you can argue with the foundation of what Dr. Marzano has put out there that goes into a quality lesson in terms of introduction, the structure of the lesson, the use of assessments, how do you close a lesson, how do you measure where the students are. I don't think you can argue actually with the process. The challenges become in the actual implementation. Um, and there are varying levels of understanding that folks have about um, what actually goes into it. Yeah, so one of the, one of the books that, that he put out was called The Art and Science of Teaching. Um, and I think that it's, it's challenging for folks not to get wrapped up in the actual tool. That's the evaluation tool that's used, which truly is the science of it's, it's hard and fast. You are being measured on a scale you know, of zero to four about whether or not you're doing something. But as educators, to truly an art to what you do you know, that's, that not always is measured and scientific because there's a connective piece. There's a relationship that exists between an instructor and her students or an instructor and his students. Um, so I like the model. I like the information. I like the research that goes behind it. It's definitely challenging to use. So going into, into this year with it, into the third year, I think there are definitely things that we will continue to improve upon. Um, we will continue to offer professional development for the administrators as well as the certificated staff uh, about what actually goes through. Um, I would I would contend honestly uh, as well that you know that there really should not be dramatic discussion in a classroom between a teacher and and the students about the Marzano you know that this we're doing this for Marzano or this is meets the needs of Marzano or, in terms of what's there um, I'd say that, that it, you know good instruction is good instruction how do we measure that what goes into it is, is really the bigger piece of it. Um, at Cherry Hill East, um, there are recently um, new regulations implemented. Um, concerning study hall. The study hall is now much more strict than it used to be and homeroom is now um, much more tightly regulated. Um, were you behind these new regulations and if so, what do you hope to achieve by them? <laughs> so, um, I would, I'm not sure exactly what it is with, with study hall. Um, you know, with, with homeroom, um, so there are certain pieces that as educators that we're responsible for. You know, the, the, the primary thing in schools on a daily basis is daily basis, safety and security of the students. Um, so one of the things that we do is, as educators and teachers do on a regular basis, period by period, is take attendance. Um, so, and again, I would have to find out exactly what they are in terms of tightening those things up. If it involves taking attendance and knowing where kids are, then yes, I would say that, that I probably was behind you know, the actual implementation or, uh, you know, or, the, or the management of doing that in terms of where it is. Um, study hall, I'm not really sure though, because I'm not sure uh, what the change would have been. Um, my piece with, with everybody, with the building principles, and, and then as it trickles down, you know, into the buildings, uh, is the accountability piece. You know, if, if somebody comes in, um, you know, if, if, if my wife goes up to, to, to West to pick up one of my daughters, 
uh, goes in the office and said, I need to pick up my daughter, can you get her? And they can't find her? That's an issue. Uh, we need to know where are the students. Now, is that challenging during lunch? Yes, because kids can be in the cafeteria, they can be in different spots eating. But if the child is assigned a homeroom at that time, we should know where that, where that, where that student is. Uh, you know, and, and know what's going on. Um, so it becomes a relationship piece. You know, homeroom is not new. The concept of homeroom existed before the schedule was changed. Um, you know, it's just that it occurs at a different time during the day, um, and it's a little bit longer uh, in, in terms of what's there. Um, so Cherry Hill has added an additional 800 apartments on the west side of town. How will this affect the school district? <laughs> um, so there, there's two pieces. Yep, uh, there, the, the agreements have gone out about apartments being built. Um, so one is, will they be built and when will they be built? Um, and then the second piece, there needs to be demographic study and demographic work done within the district about how many students do they project will be there. Um, and then what will the age of those kids be? You know, so there's a, there are some, some folks that we'll have to bring in and work with to make a determination about how will that affect us in terms of the schools. Um, and then we'll have to look at when they come in, where will they go to school? You know, Where will the seats be? Because it's our responsibility. If a child lives in Cherry Hill, it's our responsibility to educate them. If they come in and register, we have to provide them with an education. Um, you know, if, if uh, and as the, the town has transitioned, you know, there was a time in the 1970s when High School East and High School West were both on split sessions. Half the kids went in the morning, the other half the kids went in the afternoon, because there were literally thousands and thousands of kids at both of the high schools. Because it was the time frame when everything was growing, and there were just a lot of young families that were here, and everybody had kids. Um, you know, we're in a transitional time within the township now. The building of those apartments and, and the actual renting of the apartments and families being in there will have an impact on us for sure. Um, but that's, you know, we'll project out over the next few years about what do we think that will be and, and where will those children go to school. What would you like students specifically at East uh, to know about you? Um, so I guess the, the biggest thing is that, that, that I've lived here for a long time. Um, and I will continue and always want to champion Cherry Hill, the success of Cherry Hill. Uh, the fact that I was principal at, at West for seven years, you know, I loved West. I attended there as a student. Um, I've had great experience and opportunity during the course of the last two years in my job to spend time at East, to be in classrooms at East, to be at events, um, you know, be at athletic events and, and things like that. East is an incredibly um, diverse and incredibly thriving community. Um, I feel that I'm very lucky to have had the opportunity up to this point to be a small part of that. Um, and the, the big piece is that, that I hope that they know that I want to be an even larger piece of that. You know, I'm looking forward to coming in and seeing the shows this year. They're you know, coming in and seeing the concerts and, and seeing the marching band, you know, and seeing the football team compete. Um, you know, I, I've been thrilled over the last couple of years to, uh, you know, to, to go and to watch the, basket, the, the basketball team compete and, and be so successful. Um, you know, but continuing to build relationships and introducing myself you know, to students and, and being involved with the students with, uh, you know, uh, you know, being involved with the students uh, with what goes on. Um, and where do you see the school district five years, five years from now? So I see uh, Cherry Hill as we go into 2020-2021 um, being even more diverse uh, in terms of the makeup of the student body uh, and what the student body looks like in, in each of the schools. Um, I see the, the name of, of Cherry Hill Public Schools um, being recognized throughout the state, throughout the region, throughout the country uh, as being a central hub in education. Uh, I see our students' voices uh, and our students' work being shared beyond the confines of our school district. And I see people continuing, I, I, I see a lot of, um, of sales of homes um, you know, and, and properties, you know, rental properties being filled because people want to be here, because people want to be here to raise their families. Because people, when they when they leave and go to college, they want to come back here, you know, and establish themselves. But I see Cherry Hill being thriving five years from now, growing on the successes that we've had, um, and I also see five years from now, I see the, a lot of work going on within our schools. You know, as as, as Mal asked about the you know the physical infrastructure, the work is being addressed. That some has been addressed. The work is continuing to be addressed, and then we have a plan for what that is going to look like ten years, you know, into the future. Uh, but I see Cherry Hill thriving. Um, I see kids being challenged, and, and I see us being recognized not just in Newsweek, but in other pub publications, um, you know, as it, as it goes through. But knowing truly, and what's most important to me, is that as I meet individual families and individual students, that they can talk about their connection to the district, their own individual level of success, and how they grew while they were here. Sure. Okay. 
So you have a reputation for being a very uh, dapper dresser. <laughs> Who is your fashion influence? That's a, so I, I like clothes. I like color. You know, I, I like different, and, and which is kind of funny, as I, as I have a black suit and you know a, a purple shirt and tie on today. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I have just one influence to go there. I, so I have had a similar style since I was in high school. Uh, in fact, when I when I go back to pictures, how we do the big group picture of the senior class. So I'm sitting on the floor in the front. I was involved in student government, and I actually have on a shirt and tie. Uh, in the picture, in my loafers and no socks and you know, the whole thing. Um, so one of my favorite books of all time is Great Gatsby. Um, and I truly believe that the fashion that existed then is what should exist now. So if I had to go back and, and pick just one influence, I would really say that Gatsby-esque perspective you know, on, on where it is. I like a hat. You know, I, I like a tie. I like fancy shoes. I like you know, the different color. I like Madras the pants. And, I have all the different pants with the different, I have cra you know, ones with that have crabs embroidered and lobsters and ducks and, you know, whales and, and things like that. I just, I just like that, you know. And, and people always laugh, especially with the madras, you know, with the the different color plaids. Like, oh, you must have been playing golf. I've never played around a round of golf in my life, you know, unless there was a big clown's head at the end. You know, I've never actually been out and swung a golf club to play. But I just like the color. I like the suspenders. I like, you know, it's just just that piece. Um, you know, it's the, the kind of person with, with and, and you guys deal with it on a regular basis in your own way, you know, we are faced with so many challenges and so much stuff that goes on. You know, I'm going to choose happy every day. Um, I, you know, I'm very fortunate that I like my work, um, you know, and, and there are challenges that go along with it and there are people that are unhappy at times. I'm going to choose happy every day. And if I'm going to choose happy, I'm going to make my own fun. And if that means that, you know, one day I want to wear a pair of pants with whales on it or I want to wear a bow tie and a sweater vest and I'm going to, or a, a, a you know, a, a sleeveless sweater, I'm going to tuck it in, I'm going to do that because I like that, it makes me happy. Um, you know, it's just, uh, just where it is. But yeah, so one influence, I would, I would say, you know, go back to, to uh, you know, Fitzgerald and you know, the, the Gatsby-esque perspective of where it is. So if we ever had to come up with uniforms, that's where we would be. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.